a wonderful privilege um, to be sharing with you and bringing the word to you this morning. Um, and so as we're gathered here as a church, I want to just to take a moment. I'm going to pray in a moment, but uh, just think, close your eyes. And what are the pictures that come to mind as you think of church? And um, we'll come back to that after I pray, okay? Lord, we want to thank you for the ability to come and worship you, to be in this building freely, to sing songs that exalt your name, that actually remind us of who you are, um, that you are the God, that we worship your attributes. Lord, that this worship also gives us opportunity to contribute as our own um, to be a partner with this community for your purpose and for your glory. And so today as we do church, but we're also going to talk about church, may this be about you. And may you be glorified in a mighty and great powerful way in our lives. So what picture came to mind as you were thinking of church? And I'll take you through a few of mine. Um, I grew up on a farm uh, at least 50 miles from town. So church was actually at the tennis club. It was the tennis club on Saturday. Uh, on the uh, third Sunday of the month was the Methodist service. And on the fifth Sunday of the month, which you know not every month has one of those, was the Anglican service. Uh, that was my first experience, and I went to school and uh, was very involved in a school that w was associated with high church. And so we had a beautiful chapel uh, in the shape of a cross. We had an amazing gabled ceiling, um, pews, incredible wooden pews, close to 100 years old, uh, incredibly beautiful. Um, I came to know Christ, and I got involved with a Baptist church, and um, again, it was a bit more rectangular than this, but uh, chairs could be hauled out when needed, and uh, we made sure that the chairs were comfortable, but not too comfortable. Um, and then I got involved as a growing Christian with mission work, and I went to church um, in Botswana, under a tree, or in Ethiopia, under a blue tarpaulin, similar to those that FEMA hands out. Or sometimes even in the blazing sun, because there wasn't any shade at all. And I remember the one incident in Botswana. People coming to church on a sleigh. Now you may think, a sleigh in Botswana where there's no uh, snow? It's just there's so much sand that the wheels get stuck. And so the sleigh is needed getting to church. And so church has many different pictures for, for us. And so today I want to take us um, through a journey of the book of Acts uh, and look at what was church for the disciples. What was the church for Paul and Peter and those early believers? And so we're going to journey through the book of Acts today uh, very quickly. Um, and so just giving you a, a highlight of what the sermon is going to look like, what the message is going to look like today. Uh, we're going to do a, a study of Acts, a uh, fly through, I should say, of Acts. Then um, I'll take you to on some of my trips to meet some churches. And then we'll do um, something more a little contemporary. We'll actually watch a video of a first century church. Um, and so I hope you'll enjoy it and you'll be with us. So recently when I preached uh, here, uh, the message was from Acts chapter 2, um, and it's sort of the definition of a church and one that we use as we go around the world planting churches. But I want to focus on verse 46 and 47. Reading there, um, this is the birth of the church, so verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So that's the time. That's on the day of Pentecost, just after Peter, Peter had preached that first sermon, and uh, 3,000 were added or came to be the starting founding members of the church on that day. And so that's an exciting moment for us as the church. Uh, we move through chapter 3 and 4, where chapter 3, there's that incredible healing of the lame man, and they come into the, the temple leaping and praising God. There's that uh, Sunday school song we often used to sing. Um, but what happens as a result is persecution. Uh, Peter and John are called in to the Sanhedrin, and they're reprimanded and sent home with, uh, don't continue to preach in the name of Jesus. But they do it again, and so uh, verse chapter 4 is again them uh, being hauled back in for preaching uh, at the temple. And so we're seeing a persecution start of the church. And so at the end of um, a reprimand by the Sanhedrin, they actually are flogged. And verse chapter 5, verse 41 and 42 reads, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. But here we see, remember, they've just been persecuted on the temple courts. So it's very limited, their opportunities there. Where are their main opportunities? Where are they meeting? They didn't have buildings like this. They didn't have those beautiful Gothic cathedrals we see in Europe. All they had was their homes. And so that's where they met. This is the founding foundation of our church, is meeting in homes. And what happens when they go to the temple courts? They're actually doing evangelism. They're doing ministry, reaching out to the lost. And so as we see the temple or the, the religious structures, that's a place of uh, doing ministry. And oftentimes we do ministry as a way of training. And so they're getting equipped on how to share their faith, how to bring others to Christ at the temple. But they're having fellowship. They're doing worship. They're encouraging one another in the homes. Um, scrolling a little bit further. Uh, so just at the end of chapter 5 there, going into chapter 6, um, there's the appointment of the seven, um, Stephen and Philip and a few others, five others to be exact. Um, and it follows straight into the message that Stephen delivers about who Jesus is and uh, the persecution, ongoing persecution, that takes place in the temple space. Um, and so chapter 7 ends with Stephen has been stoned for preaching and being proclaiming the gospel at the temple. And so Acts chapter 1 um, sort of... <laughs> second part of it, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the disciples were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned, him, mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women to put them in prison. So if they were meeting in a church like this, it's an easy place to find them. But they were meeting in homes. Church was a home. It was a community. And so those that were still in Jerusalem, Paul had to go and find them in their houses. Um, so we do have the disciples, and I think it's not just the 12 that were there. Um, there were some others, obviously, because somebody had to bury Stephen. Um, and Paul was finding people there as well. But it is a great opportunity and a great uh, day where we see the gospel spreading from Jerusalem to uh, Judea and to Samaria. And 
And so we see the gospel starting to move out. And so that's one thing is persecution. Just this past week, I received an email from um, our leader who's responsible for East Asia. He's uh, visiting his, um, he is Chinese and he was visiting his countrymen. Um, and they have spent in the last month, uh, they've been in police headquarters um, for over a week. Fortunately, they've been able to go home, but there's been severe interrogation and persecution of the church in China. Not just, it's across the church, not one organization. But when you start meeting in homes, it becomes a lot freer. You have a lot more opportunity. Uh, earlier this year, I was at a conference about uh, work in Algeria. The, ch the government in Algeria has closed down all the churches. Now, one. have a road stop in their journey, and start to study the Bible. Close community and fellowship. So persecution helps spread the gospel, but it does have its challenges. So going along a little bit further, the gospel is spread. Um, in Acts 9 and 10, we see it going to the Ethiopian eunuch. We see the gospel coming. And... Um, it's spreading amongst the Jewish people, but in chapter 10, um, the Lord tells Cornelius to go and get Peter to come and bring him the, the gospel. Cornelius is a Roman uh, general, and so Peter goes to his house, but it's, it's complicated. Because at this stage, we've only been giving the gospel to our fellow Jews. He's an Italian. He's ungodly, <laughs> uncircumcised in a sense. And so uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 23, I'm, I'm going to skip a few verses, but 23 to 27 is the whole passage. As Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, so the second part of verse 23, then Peter, the next day, Peter started out with those who had come to fetch him, and as he entered um, Cornelius' house, Cornelius met with him, verse 25. And um, skip over verse 26 into verse 27. So Peter and Cornelius talk and walk into the house. And when Peter enters, founds a large gathering of people. Um, it, it tells us in one sense, yes, Cornelius was Roman and he may have had a bigger house than usual. But I've been to Israel and many of those communal houses have space where the, there's space for us to gather sort of 10 to 20 people, um, and have fellowship. And so that is possible. And even in Cornelius' house, it was, uh, if we read earlier, it was family and friends that he had gathered. And so again, we see the church in Cornelius' house. Um, in Acts chapter 11, uh, Peter has to explain it, uh, his uh, situation. And so we'll skip over that and then going. But we see an ongoing persecution. Um, Herod um, pers uh, kills uh, the apostle James. And so a great persecution breaks out in, in the city of Jerusalem. And because they like it, um, Herod suddenly thinks, oh, well, let me grab hold of Peter as well. <laughs> Uh, he's a nice ringleader, and if uh, the Jews like this killing thing, I'll, I'll win some favor. But we have G Peter's miraculous escape from prison. The day before he's about to be tried or executed, an angel comes and wakes him up, and uh, chains fall off, and he gets dressed, and he's heading out, and he's not even sure, is this a dream or is this um, uh, real? And as he goes along, he discovers, suddenly wakes up and realizes, this is real. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so in verse 12, he's now woken up and he's real. And where does he go? He goes to his friends, to the body of Christ. He goes to the house of Mary. Uh, so Acts 12, verse 12 says, uh, When this had dawned on, P on him, Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And so the body of Christ had come together. Now I want to say that the house of Mary is not the only house in Jerusalem where they were praying. But that's the fellowship where Peter regularly participated. And Rhodia, the servant, knew who Peter was. Even though she forgot to open the door <laughs> to let him in, she knew who he was. She could recognize his voice. And so... Uh, Again, we see the church persecuted in the temple, but free to worship in the home. Um, we have um, um, Acts, chapter Acts chapter 13, where 13, Paul goes on a missionary, goes on missionary journey, 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 and, and he goes he to, goes to uh, Galatia, uh, Galatia um, uh, or modern-day modern Turkey. Day Turkey. There's no churches there. Yes, there are uh, Roman temples and uh, Roman uh, gods, but there's no church. And so as he establishes, he continues that continues pattern. That pattern. That pattern. But we see it but more see clearly, it clearly uh, laid, uh, laid out for us as we go on his second missionary journey. journey. And uh, he and, goes uh, into goes Macedonia. 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 So reading so from, reading from um, um, some passages some in passages Acts 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16 uh, we see, uh, we see, uh, see uh, Paul uh, arrives in Philippi. It's just off the coast, um, and so he gets there, and it, again, it's another Roman city. There's no church. There is a synagogue because uh, the Jews have, over the years, because of various persecution, fled across the Roman Empire, and there are Jews throughout the whole Roman Empire. And so Paul typically starts with those who are closest to the gospel, uh, those that are already know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they know about God's promise of a coming Messiah. And so that's where uh, Paul goes as, as he starts his message. He starts with those who are close to the gospel. Now, in many of the places, there was a synagogue. Now, I've seen many of those, and they're not very big. I think this whole section here wouldn't even fit into one of those synagogues. That's the one in Corinth, which I saw, was most probably sort of from the pillars to the wall, um, is the size of the synagogue that was meeting there. Now remember, the Jews are a minority. They're um, living in another city, and so their meeting place and fellowship place is pretty small. Um, and so that's a reminder. So anyway, um, back to where <laughs> Philippi. Um, Paul arrives in Philippi. Uh, he's looking for a place of worship, it appears that Philippi did not have a synagogue. And so on the day of worship, Paul goes out the city to the river uh, where people would typically go for worship, and he finds a group of God-fearing people. He shares the gospel, and uh, reading from verse 14 of Acts chapter 16, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And so we see Paul having a base um, in Lydia's house to do ministry. The unfortunate thing is, uh, some of the Jews and some of the other people in, in Philippi get upset with Paul. And so a riot starts and Paul ends up in jail. His traveling companion with him as well, Silas. And uh, you may be very familiar with that passage. We're not going to read it, but I'll just mention. Where they're singing in jail at midnight. And suddenly an earthquake happens. Um, th their worship, whether it was their worship or whatever. <laughs> but suddenly the jailer is like petrified now. His prisoners have escaped. He's about to lose his life. So it's easier to take it himself than uh, have the Roman officials take his life. But Paul says, hey, wait, stop. We're still here. <laughs> we haven't gone anywhere. And so after um, the jailer verifying everything, 
16 verse 33, still in Philippi. So, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And so there is a whole household coming to faith as Paul had opportunity to minister and to be ministered to. And so the next day they want to let Paul go quietly and uh, after Paul's resistance, uh, at the end in verse 40, Paul and, Paul and Silas are busy leaving um, Philippi. And after, reading from verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them, then they left. And so you can see that Lydia's house has become the church in Philippi. It is interesting when you visit the city, you will find the ruins of a basilica. A basilica is um, the big church structures that we're familiar with in, in Europe. But that was not there when Paul was there. Um, and so we see the church very much in Lydia's house. And so we'll come back later to, to the Basilica in um, Philippi and around the Mediterranean. Obviously now there's persecution, so Paul's on his way again, his journey. And as I said earlier, persecution is oftentimes a means for the gospel to spread. And so Paul goes to uh, Thessaloniki. Um, in Thessalonica, um, there is a synagogue. It was actually quite a large Jewish community in Thessalonica. Um, it's about a hundred mile journey. I didn't quite look up exactly, but uh, when we drove uh, in the bus, it was about an hour and a half. And so I figured about a, a hundred miles for us in terms of getting to Thessaloniki. So it took him a few days. Uh, and when he and Silas um, and Timothy got there, they started preaching the gospel. Um, the Jews didn't like that. And so as we look in um, Acts 17 verse 5, um, but other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started in a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. You may be saying, hey, Stephen, we get it. <laughs> but it's here. It's in Scripture. They were meeting in Jason's house. Paul goes to uh, Berea. The Bereans were more um, noble than the Thessalonians. And they studied the scripture and found what Paul was teaching was true. But Paul moved on again from there, headed to Athens. And there's an incredible uh, story in, in Acts about him preaching um, at Mars Hill uh, to the philosophers and to the unknown God. Um, and so a church is established and then moves on to Corinth. Um, in Acts 18, verse 2 and 3, we see uh, there Paul met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Caesar Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave room. Rome. Sorry. Uh, Paul went to see them and became, because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And used that as a base. Um, and so Priscilla and Aquila, the name switched around, Aquila being the husband, um, but uh, Priscilla becomes the leader of that house church. Um, and uh, they move later with Paul to um, Ephesus, and so we'll look at that in, when we get there. But that's where their, their church begins, and they, they're there for two years uh, almost. So a few verses later, in um, verse 7 and 8, uh, after some persecution breaks out, Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And so again, we see the house becoming the church. Now that building or that space that they used for the synagogue stayed the property of the, the Jewish people. Um, and so the church continued to be in the homes. 
going a little further on uh, in Acts. Um, so Paul moves and uh, Priscilla and Aquila join him and they go to Ephesus. So they journey back through the, visiting the churches. And so in 24, Acts 24, they get to Ephesus. Um, in, in, at the synagogue in Ephesus, um, let me read it here from verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scripture. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he, only, he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And so here in Ephesus, we see Priscilla and Aquila leading one home church. Um, so the community in Ephesus starts to grow, and there's a lot um, in Acts 18 and 19 about the church in Ephesus, and then we do have the book of Ephesus, uh, book of Ephesians, and even the, the book of Galatians to some extent is a result of the church in Ephesus. Um, and so we'll get to that in a moment. But So in verse Acts 19 we see what does Paul do with the opposition? They're not available or open to being in um, the synagogue anymore. And so we see in verse 9 and 10. Um, but some of them became obstinate, the Jews that is. They refused to believe and the, they publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And so this is the first time we actually see another building referenced in the book of Acts. There's the temple. There's been these synagogues where Paul goes and does ministry, but it's temporary. And we've seen the home as a building block and a foundation to the church up to this point. Now, the hall of Tyrannus belonged to Tyrannus, so Paul was renting it in some, at some way. We speculate, most probably, because the Roman days sort of uh, took a break with lunch, then there was a siesta, and then there may be something in the evening. It means the hall of Tyrannus was open and available between lunch and through the siesta. And so we anticipate or ex extrapolate to believe that those were the hours that Paul used Tyrannus's hall for teaching and equipping. So jumping from the, that, I want to jump to Ephesians chapter 4. And the reason I want to jump there is, what was Paul doing while he was in um, that hall of Tyrannus? What is some of the content that we, he was delivering? And so we see um, in Ephesians 4 verse 11 through 13, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we see these homes and these churches being places where people are being equipped. We come here on a Sunday to be equipped. We go and study the scripture to be equipped. Our fellowship is yes for worship, but also for equipping, so that we may go out into the marketplace, into the different places where we may find people and bring the gospel. And so that's an exciting piece to it. We don't see another Hall of Tyrannus again in terms of the Scriptures. What we do see is we go and read all of the epistles. Almost at the end of every one, Paul is sending greetings to different households. Different groups and different places where they were meeting in the city of Rome. In so-and-so who meets in the house of... 
And so we see this continuing throughout the scriptures as we have it. So when did we start meeting like this? When did we start having these basilicas being built as we find in the ancient city of Philippi, which is really a ruin today, uh, or in the beautiful cathedrals we see across Europe? When did that start? Now, many of us have heard of um, the Emperor Constantine. He's the first one who made Christianity um, the official religion of Rome. And so it was a huge shift from paganism and the worship of Zeus and Apollos and other gods to the worship of Christ. His mother is believed to be the one who may have led him to Christ. And she is one who pilgrimed to Israel and uh, inquired of people about where many of the holy sites are. And uh, through tradition, we have many of those sites recorded. But as you go there, you'll find, oh, this is the Catholic version of where um, Jesus was born, and this is the Orthodox version of where Jesus was born, and this is the Protestant version of where he was born. <laughs> we do not know the exact spots. Yes, uh, Constantine's mother may have had some influence and input in terms of... And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what does matter is Jesus was a very real human. He lived and walked on this earth, and there is um, an abundance of historical evidence that we can go and look at in the British Museum and other historic places. That, that is not a historically disputed fact. But Constantine, when did he reign? He became emperor in 306 A.D., the 4th century, the beginning of the 4th century, Constantine became emperor. Up till that point, for 300 years, they met in homes. Um, in understanding and researching a little bit about Constantine, I discovered the most severe persecution of Christians took place in 303 AD. Right before Rome became a Christian or Christianity became officially recognized. So the homes continued to be a central place for the gospel and for worship and for church. That's a lot of information I've just given you. <laughs> That's a long Bible study. I hope it's been fun. I hope it's been interesting. But you may be saying, so what? <laughs> hey, Stephen, why? Why are you telling us all of this? Um, I want to, before completely answering that, I want to shift a little bit to what I do. Um, and so you've heard Marie and I, missionaries, and you've, most of you have known us. Um, actually, this week... Um, we've, we've been in the U.S. 10 years, and this is the church we joined in that first six months that we were part of this, uh, living in this country. And so it's great for us to be here, and great to know that you know us, and you're our family, both spiritually and relationally, and so we thank you for that. It is a great privilege to have Marie's mom physically with us at this time, as we celebrate this milestone. <laughs> But also, as you know us, uh, some of you joke uh, as I walk in the door. It's like, so when are you leaving again? <laughs> You're on the road again. Um, all of those sort of little jokes. And so I want to in bring you with me on some of those journeys. Because my role, as I've shared with you oftentimes, is about church planting. And uh, which is why I'm passionate about the house church. Um, and that that is something, a key building block for the growth of the church. And I've seen it around the world. And so this picture um, is just some of our friends. So in April this year, we were together, gathered um, over 300 church planting leaders together for a conference. And so... Um, 
in doing that, um, I want to tell you what, what I perceive. Um, this is not in my job description, but this is boiling down what my job is as I go and meet with these people and others like them, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, I'm helping Christian organizational leaders think about fulfilling the Great Commission. In their scope, and I'll come back to that in a moment, by planting missional or faith communities that multiply to the fourth generation in multiple streams and beyond. Now that's a big mouthful. And um, you don't need to put it up, Kenneth. Um, stay with this photo. What am I meaning? So I work with different Christian organizational leaders. Some of them are part of our organization of crew. Some of them are part of the Baptist Union, and they're planting Baptist churches. Um, some are part of the Lutheran Church, or were part of the Lutheran Church. And so I'm working with a broad spectrum of Christian leaders from citywide, nationwide, geographic region-wide leaders who are focused on fulfilling the Great Commission. And that they're doing it by planting churches or missional communities or faith communities or multiplying churches. <laughs> There's so many names out there for what I do. All meaning gathering people for worship in a home setting. And that because it's in a home setting, it can multiply into more groups. Um, but we don't just want another group. We want to go to four generations. That this group has planted another group, and they, that group has planted another group. And that you see four generations. And not just one on one on one on one planting, but each one planting three or four. And that's what I mean by multiple streams. Because that's the way the early church did it. And I believe that we as a church, and especially now as we're seeking a pastor, and I'm not saying we mustn't look for a pastor, we need to look for a pastor, but to the leadership, the transition committee and uh, the board of elders, let's find one who is missional, who's going to empower us and equip us to go out and do uh, multiplication. Let us pray that God will send, come to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. We're praying, and I'm seeing people's hearts earnestly seeking God. Let's come and pray, because this is a matter of prayer. And let's pray together for the right person. And so I'm going to take us uh, over to, almost to Barcelona. Uh, there's a slide here of San Cuat, the map. So you see where Barcelona is. And so just behind the mountains from Barcelona is a city called San Cuat. There are about uh, 100,000 people living in San Cuat. Um, it's um, my friend, David Oliver, uh, who you'll see in the next slide. Um, he's the pastor of a Baptist church there. Uh, I've been walking a journey with David from, um, since 2017. We've investigated our training. We've looked at different ways how to help his church and what's specific to his church um, to the point where he's got a vision for those 100,000 people living in San Kuat. We need 10,000 churches. That's talking about one church for every 1,000 people. So a church in their high-rise building or in a neighborhood or some fellowship community that naturally brings people together so that we could be ministering to them. And uh, so David has seen incredible success. And so the next slide is in his church. This was on a Saturday night. Uh, some of the youth from his church, but not all of them. There's a whole lot from other churches and some that are not even from church. Coming, seeking God, learning about God, worshiping together. And that they're starting multiplying missional communities, some at the school, the high school, some at the university, um, some in their homes. And so David is starting to see multiplication happen. Yes, it's not everyone, and it's not, not we haven't reached San Kuat yet, but we're on the journey. Um, the next slide, we're jumping from the south of Spain to the north of, uh, south of Europe to 
the uh, north of Europe to Finland. This was in April. Marie and I and Monica were with this group uh, in Turku, Finland. Um, the movement in Turku, again, is not our church, it's not part of a crew, it's part of our organization, but it's someone who's taken our training and implemented it. Um, they have a network in six cities uh, within Finland. Helsinki, um, Turku is the main hub, but there's five, four other cities, and they've started new groups of exploring up into the north, northern part of the country. This photo is 50 of their leaders coming together for training. Marie was able to give some training. I gave some training. There was another church planning uh, leader also there from another organization training them. But I want to show you what they look like. These, these people are sort of in the age brackets 20 to 40. And so the next slide has them just in prayer, earnestly seeking God as I experience that we're doing here on Wednesday nights. It's not about long church prayers, but it's each one of us getting on our knees in prayer, asking God, pleading with God, make my heart right, make our hearts right, bring us the person to help lead us. Um, some of those leaders uh, in the next slide, um, or this is actually one of their groups, their Bible study groups, they call it Discovery Bible Study Groups. They take scripture and discover it. But um, the guy on the right of the screen uh, with a cap on, uh, he works in the equivalent of Walmart. He oversees the meat section of um, three or four Walmarts, the equivalent of Walmart in his city. The lady with the black shirt on, um, she's a teacher at the, uh, I'm not sure if it was high school or elementary school. Um, but these are people Day to day, people like you and me, who have got regular jobs, doing and leading churches. Um, scrolling down, um, uh, there's another photo of them. Here's a. Um, this is shifting now, all the way east into the city or country of Moldova, the city of Chisinau. Now, this is a house that Monica has actually been in, so. She uh, visited this family. They're on the, again on the right of the screen. Uh, Sandu is the dad. Uh, Tanya, the mom. Uh, Andrea was missing when this photo. I think she was actually most probably taking the photo. Monica's friend who visited us two weeks ago. And the youngest daughter, Patricia. And then Lola in Patricia's arms. <laughs> Seems like the dogs come to this church as well. But that's what happens when you're a family and you're at home. Um, and so Tanya, this church in Kishinau, this is part of the crew network and part of what we're doing. In the city of Kishinau, we have over 60 churches. Now they're organized into three separate networks. And so they meet during a month three times. They'll meet in, in, in a home. And then on the fourth time in the month, they all go to the Campus Crusade office for that network and have a group fellowship. And so again, it's just another way of doing community. And so that way, uh, no one group is too big for the whole the meeting space that they have, but it's a great picture of the church. Bringing it a little bit home, more closer to home, um, so Marie and I are on once a month. You may have noticed that we sort of disappear uh, we head actually to, usually to Lakeland, but sometimes uh, even as far as Tampa, because we're part of a South African Afrikaans home church that meets once a month. We're helping lead and facilitate that. And so what I'm telling you about I'm not, is not just theory. We're practicing it. Uh, on a Monday night, there are a gr group of us that get together to study the Bible. Now, thanks to when this group started, we started with Zoom. And because we're a little bit spread out across the city, uh, we're still continuing on Zoom. But we're meeting on a Monday night to study the Bible. And so there's great opportunity for us to do this. 
And so we're going to, in a moment, we're going to watch a video. Um, this video is from The Chosen. Um, it's a, it's a, an extract of that. Um, I don't know how many of you have been watching it. I'll confess, uh, this episode was my first episode to watch, um, and I just loved it. Um, someone showed me the clip that I'm going to show us, and I think it is just such an amazing picture of a house church. Now, it's not a study of the book of Acts like we've just done. It's a total different scripture, and the, the, this segment could be a message and a sermon all on its own. <laughs> But I want you to have a look at the interaction. Learn and appreciate the lesson that Jesus is giving in this lesson. Um, but also at the same time, look at the interaction. Because this is what the disciples experienced firsthand with Jesus. This is what they took into the house churches into Jerusalem. This is what the disciples in Jerusalem took to Judea and Samaria when they moved out of Jerusalem. This is what they took to Antioch, to Asia to uh, the ends of the earth as Paul and the other disciples took the message and the gospel. And so let's watch this uh, six minutes, roughly, interaction of Jesus. Now, for those on Facebook, I'm not sure how this is going to play out. Um, this is not our content. This is the chosen. We don't own any of it. Um, but Facebook may cut the, the stream off um, as the audio plays, so we're not sure how... But uh, we'll connect you again if that happens for you. Sorry. Um, so, uh, Kenneth, if you'll start the uh, video. Well, I'm sure by now most of you are aware of the tent village that is rapidly growing east of Capernaum. Those are people who followed us from the mount, who are now waiting to hear more. Their numbers grow by the day, as do the suspicions of Rome. In fact, Z informed me just this morning that a few members of his former order have even journeyed here. It would appear as if we were building an army, teacher. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. The other way to look at it is my way. <coughs> the correct way, you mean? Yes, Simon. Mm. Those people are like those in regions all over. They are not an army, not yet. They are in need of rescue, and you are going to help me rescue them. Different kind of rescue, see. It is not sustainable for me to do all the preaching, all the healing, and ministering. I've called you to Simon's home today, and thank you, Eden, for hosting, because our ministry will only grow, and we want it to grow till the end of the age there will be many more followers and like those not here all will have roles and responsibilities most will be disciples students but I have chosen you twelve as my apostles sending us an apostle is the same as a messenger one who I know what it means Matthew that's why I'm asking you are my leaders and for this mission I have for you it's best that you spread out and not be concentrated in one place I I don't understand I'm going to go home to Nazareth for a time and while I'm there I'm sending you out in every direction two by two specifically to our people only. Every direction, Rabbi? Yes, but not to the Gentiles. Not yet. That will come in time. But to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Just as Joshua led the twelve tribes to take the promised land. You will proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And while you are on this mission, you will heal the sick and the lame by anointing them with oil. You will cast out demons. You will clean. What? Right. Why are you all looking at me like that? Uh, could, could you just repeat that one more time? 
I'm sending you out two by two, proclaiming as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cast out demons. Uh, how soon are we talking about here? There's that word again. I'll get to that, Simon. Hold on. Heal the sick? Cast out demons? While you are on this mission, I grant you this authority. Someday, you will have it all the time. Was that a ceremony I missed? This is it. Don't feel any different? I don't need you to feel anything to do great things. But, uh, with all due respect, Rabbi, we've only just begun as students. We're not nearly qualified enough. Why would you need us for this work? He doesn't need us. He wants us. Thank you, Sim. Very good. John, if I needed religious leaders or qualified students for my ministry, I wouldn't have chosen... <laughs> well, you get the point. Can we get back to the part about healing the sick for one second? You will take nothing for your journey, except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money. Not even Salome's food. or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. And if anyone should not receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or town. Do not waste your time. You said if anyone will not listen to our words. What words exactly? What are we supposed to teach? Anything you've ever heard from me. I've only ever heard the one sermon. You heard the best one, anyway. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're <laughs> all so good. Uh -huh. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so we see Jesus interacting with his disciples. There's back and forth, there's a lot of fun happening. Uh, a lot of different elements there. As I say, that clip in itself could be a message all on its own. And for those uh, who on Facebook was episode season three, um, episode two. Uh, no, episode two. It's from episode two. Ep season three, episode two. Um, so in terms of Jesus is calling us to meet like that, to have that sort of interaction about his word and about applying it to our lives, just as those disciples had it, as that struggle of, yes, what does this mean? What does it look like as I go from here? And so I want to trust that the Lord is going to bring us a leader like that as we seek the um, new pastor and new leadership here that that journey would draw us to a place where each one of us, each day, are thinking, how do I live out my faith? At school, at work, um, at the factory, whatever the place is that we are, that we're living out our calling of who Jesus has called us to be. And that we do that in fellowship with each other, in our homes, that our homes become a regular meeting place. In the modern world today, we're all so busy, but I think we're missing out. No, I don't think. I know we are missing out on the, the amazing opportunity that God has given us. And so how do we find that natural way for our homes 
to be the place from which the gospel goes out. And so there is a time and a place for this and for us to be here. And so I'm not saying we stop services. But I'm saying there is more to what we could experience if we are willing to take the, make some sacrifices but take some steps in that direction as well. And so I'm excited to be a part of Catalyst as we're making this transition as a church. As we look for a new leader, may community be a, a very real part of this church. And I believe we had that. We, that was something this church was well known for. You walked in here and you just got hugged by everybody. And then COVID stopped that at some point. <laughs> so um, on that note, I want to just pray for us. I want to pray for the um, transition team and the leadership um, as they trust the Lord for this. And then we'll hand back to Pastor um, Seth, Reverend Seth. Lord, I want to just thank you for this time. I want to thank you for your word, that we could journey through the book of Acts and see what the church looked like right at the start. We could see a vision that we may be drawn back to. Help us to be a place that equips, empowers, sends out but also a place where we find fellowship and community. And so as we surrender to you, may it be about you, Lord. May this church and the new leader that you are bringing be your man who brings us before your throne and makes this a lighthouse. That all in Meadowwoods, all in South Orlando, all in the greater Orlando area will know you because of the light shining from this church, Lord. And so I pray for the, the eldership. I pray for the transition team. I pray for us as the body of Christ in this place. May we live out that calling that you have called the church to that you would be glorified, seeking your wisdom, seeking your presence, and surrendering to your direction, even when it may be hard. Ask this in your wonderful name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand to your feet? The Bible says, what does the prophet of man to gain this whole world and lose his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for the lost soul? We, we, get, a, we get a whole course of meal there just now uh, about the, the, the real essence of this gospel. And so, Father, we come to you and we thank you for uh, this word that you present the preparation oh father that you already have in store you said that you will build the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail so we thank you oh god that you are the great builder and we pray for each and every one that in this house that you will use us Help us that we can be a witness, O oh Father. To love our neighbors, O oh Father, especially where we live at. To tell them about Jesus. That their blood will not be upon our shoulder. And we ask you, Father, that you will give us the right word, the right timing, how to do it. So prepare us, O oh Father, to be a sanctuary pure and holy and triumph truth so we thank you father I feel in my heart uh, this morning that if somebody is in here uh, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior 
if you can just slip your hands up quickly anybody in here that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you can slip your hands up quickly I guess everybody know the Lord but if they were to die tonight they're gonna make it into heaven's gate so father we thank you Lord um, as we about to leave this place your presence is still with us so may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God the Father the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit the Comforter rest and remain in us all now and forevermore we ask amen and amen give the Lord praise and you can reach um, brother Dell and his family and encourage them in Jesus name amen you're dismissed